I'm sure you've been speaking to someone and they've said something, perhaps it's a business agreement, and you've said to them, will you put it in writing? Well, that's exactly what God does for us when he speaks about the events that will bring about the kingdom of God. He has put it in writing. Now, if you're wise, you are not going to want to be unprepared for the last days. One of the things we're going to learn throughout this book of Revelation is that when we go back to Mount Sinai, and there's going to be, we've seen one or two thus far, but we're going to see some other references to Mount Sinai. And we've talked about how Israel was unprepared for what God wanted to do at Mount Sinai. In that same way, if we're not careful, the body of believers, the church, is going to be unprepared for what God wants to do in bringing about the kingdom of God. There's going to be a great number of people that are not found faithful. The question is, how are you going to respond to what God is revealing, teaching, and promising in this book? Are you going to put it into practice? Are you going to see that kingdom change being wrought in your life? Well, we left off last week with Messiah Yeshua being revealed to us as the one who, and don't miss this, the one who is worthy. He's the only one who is worthy, and it's only through Him and by His grace, by His forgiveness, by the shedding of His blood that you can be made worthy. See, you will never in and of yourself ever achieve worthiness before God. It's only when we receive that, when we allow God to, to, to transfer His worthiness to us as He takes our unworthiness, our sins, our transgressions, our iniquity, He takes them upon Himself and in actuality, He's done that 2,000 years ago. When He who knew no sin became sin for us on that cross. He took all that punishment. Why? So that you could be made worthy. What does that mean? That you could be part of that kingdom of God. And the question is, is that important to you? Are you going to learn the truths of the kingdom so that you can be faithful in these last days? And I think as we study this book in the weeks to come, we're going to see that some of these events are not too far off. Well, let's pick up where we left off last week, Revelation chapter 5, and look with me, if you would, to verse 10. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. Now, as I said, we see a description in the previous few verses of Messiah taking that scroll, loosening those seals, and opening up this, this book. And what I want you to see is that this revelation of the kingdom brought those creatures, those four creatures, and those 24 elders to worship God. They sung a new song, a kingdom song, and they praised Him. And I want you to see the outcome. And this is true for who? Well, here's a very important change. If you go back some time to the book of Exodus chapter 19, chapter 19 and verse 6, you're going to see that God has a plan. And that plan was to take the 12 tribes of Israel and make them a kingdom of priests. But what happened? They rebelled. They were not ready for what God wanted to do. At Mount Sinai, when God uh, began to approach them to bring about a transition in their life, to put them in a new condition where they would know God's will and they would no longer be able to sin. Read Exodus 20 at the end of that chapter very carefully. God wanted to give His people a dynamic experience, but they rebelled. They said, don't you speak to us, but we'll listen to Moses. They chose man over God. And what happens? Well, we're suffering from that decision ever since. There's this long process. But here in the book of Revelation chapter 5, we see what the redemptive work of Messiah can do. Because in this passage, it's praising the one who is worthy to begin this process of speaking the kingdom of, of God into being. 
And what do we see? Look at verse 10. It speaks about every tribe, nation, language, and people that God wants to, by means of faith in Messiah, makes them into what? He says, into a kingdom of priests or kings and priests unto God. For what purpose? That we might reign over the earth. When's that going to be? Well, understand this in two levels. Right now, God has equipped us, if you are a follower of Messiah, that you have confessed your sins, that you have received the gospel, then you are a new creation. He says, all those things in the past, well, they are done away with. Behold, all is new. Remember, we talked about how that word new is uniquely related to the kingdom. So we have the potential to rule in this world. That is to be a force for the kingdom of God. What happens most of the time? Most of the time, as we saw in our study of the book of Ephesians, we, we quench the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit. Instead of walking in the newness of life, we, we prefer and we regress to darkness and we do not fulfill the, the spirit potential that we have in this age. We're not living as kingdom and priests. We're not demonstrating the rule. But in the kingdom of God, those who have been redeemed, by means of an event, and we'll talk about this more in Revelation chapter 7, we are going to be transformed into the rulers of God. We are going to demonstrate the authority that God wants His people to have. And that's why He says in verse 10, He says, and they will rule over the earth. Verse 11. And I looked and I listened to the voice of many angels Round about what? You don't even have to read it. You should know the throne of God. Over and over and over, this word throne appears. So there's this multitude of angels. They are around the throne of God and the, the creatures, those four living creatures and the elders. And it says that the number of them was so great, it was a, a mildred of mildreds and thousands of thousands. And what did they do? Verse 12. And they called in a great voice, saying that, that worthy is the Lamb who has been slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and splendor and glory and blessing. Now, he's receiving that. What is it a reference to? It is very similar to what we've alluded to several times in this study of the book of Revelation, and that's Daniel chapter 7 where Messiah Yeshua, who emptied himself, remember what it speaks of in Philippians chapter 2, that this one who did not equate uh, uh, divinity with God, something to be grasped, that is, he is divine. But he emptied himself and became came humble, even to the point of death, death on a cross. And what's happening now? Well, in that same Philippians chapter 2, we see that God has given to him the name above all names, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to the glory of the Father, that what? That Messiah Yeshua is Lord. And, and that's in essence what these creatures and these 24 elders are doing. They're saying in a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who has been slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and splendor and glory and blessing. Verse 13, and all of creation, whether it be in the heavens or in the earth or under the earth or in the sea and all which is in the sea, it says all of them I heard say, speak saying to the one who sits upon the throne and to what? The Lamb. Now, what I want you to see here is that remember what the book of Revelation is doing. We see the Lamb moving from, from being near the throne, being on the right hand of the throne, and now we see more and more Him being likened to the one who sits upon the throne. So it's simply a reference of a transition. What transition are we talking about? Well, there's a couple places in the Scripture. When God the Father, let me just simply say that I believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Many times people write me emails and letters asking, do you believe in the Trinity? Yes, I do. And what we see is this. There is a time coming, God says it, that the Father has given all aspects of judgment to the Son. That He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And what we're seeing in this book of Revelation is simply a transition. A transition from the throne of God and the one who set upon it, God the Father. And now we're seeing that throne being made to establish in this world, that's what's going to happen. And the one who sits upon it is going to be the Lamb. That's this transition. And what do we read further on? We'll look again. He says here that all of creation, whether it's in the heavens or the earth or under the earth or in the sea or in the midst of the sea, it says that they cried out saying to the one who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb, blessing and, and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four creatures, they said, amen. Now, here again, not only does that word amen means that's true, but also is a word that demands a response. The question is this, is your life and my life going to reflect that reality? of who Messiah is, that all glory and honor and blessing and power and might, all this has been given to him. If so, what is that a statement of? One thing, that we are called to submit to him. Now, now we've gone a few weeks, and I've been commented upon one of the most important things that I like to teach on, and that is submissiveness. And over and over in this, this book of Revelation, Messiah is being revealed to us as one who has earned, not only is naturally he's God and demands that we submit to him, but he has demonstrated, he has acted, he has behaved in a way in laying down his life, being that lamb that was sacrificed to earn our obedience. So it's based upon two things. Naturally, intrinsically, he is worthy of of our obedience because of who he is. He didn't need to empty himself. He didn't need to die upon that cross. He didn't do, need to do anything to be worthy of our worship and our perfect obedience. But, but having said that, nevertheless, he has emptied himself and done all those things for who? For you and me. Why? So that we could experience redemption that we could be transformed by the Holy Spirit, that we could have the privilege of serving Him and demonstrating His power in our life. What do I mean by that? You know, one of the greatest blessings that a child of God has, that we become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? That God's Spirit, the very Spirit of God, now dwells in us. That we are a temple of God. What a privilege. And the question is, are we a faithful temple or not? Well, look again, verse 14. And these uh, four creatures, they responded, amen. And the 24 elders, they fell upon their faces. By the way, so far in our study of the book of Revelation, three times these elders, when Messiah Yeshua is revealed, when he is proclaimed, when he is heralded, when we see his true identity, when we see him taking his rightful place, what do the elders do? They fall down and worship. Now, here's the biblical truth. The more we are in tune with what God's up to, the more we understand the work of Messiah, not just what he did 2,000 years ago, but how he's moving and functioning and behaving in our lives, it's going to lead to us to worship Him. But I want you to see the type of worship. It just doesn't say, we're coming to that in a few minutes about worship. But prior to that, it says, they fell on their face. And don't miss the lesson that's being taught. Let me just read it and then we'll discuss it. End of verse, chapter 5 and verse 14, we read that the 24 elders, they fell upon their face. And then it says, and they worship the one who lives forever and ever. Now, notice the connection. 
I want you to see that first they fell upon their face, which is what? A total act of surrender. Now, if you are wise, you're going to be able to, to think about yesterday and last week and last month, and you're going to be able to, to, to state, to write down times that you have de demonstrated submissiveness to God, that you humbled yourself before God. Likewise, that is so important because it's this humility that positions us where we can worship God. So it's not just by accident that three times we see the elders falling upon their face. Now, this was not something they did uh, intentionally. This was simply the outcome of knowing Messiah, knowing what He's done and who He is. And the outcome of humility is that it positions us whereby we can worship God. Well, let's move on now into chapter 6. Now, chapter 6, from my position, from my vantage point, chapter 6 is one of the most important chapters in the entire book of Revelation. Because now we're going to see seals open up. Remember, there's seven. What does that speak to? Seven holiness. This scroll that has seven seals, it is about holiness coming. Let's state that another way. It's about the kingdom of God taking place. And I want you to see that the events that we're going to be studying in this first part of, of Revelation chapter 6 is very similar to what Messiah spoke of in verses 6 through 8 in Matthew 24. So there's a connection there. And I want you to see something else. If you are a good student and you remember how Messiah taught in Matthew 24, they came out of the temple, they went up on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples, they asked them a question. What was that question? They said, when are you going to establish the kingdom? And when he began to speak about the kingdom, he spoke in the terms of Revelation chapter 6. What's the point I want you to see? He was speaking to who? His disciples. And what we're going to study in Revelation chapter 6, this entire chapter is relevant. It is about what believers can experience, what we not can experience, but what we will experience in the last days. Do not make the mistake. Do not believe the false teaching that Revelation chapter 6 has nothing to do with the body of believers. Now, here's the problem that people make. People look at this and they say, you know what? There's some bad things that happen in this chapter. There are things that are not pleasant, that are, 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 are even uh, uh, wrathful. Well, let me tell you, it's not until we get to the end of Revelation chapter 6 that there is a, a announcing, not the coming, not the wrath of God, but simply the announcing that the wrath of God is near. I want to give you a scripture. Sometime uh, look up 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. Why? Because there, there's a great promise. In that promise, God is speaking about our blessed hope. And he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, he says, God, and he's talking to believers. That's very important. He says, I have not appointed you for wrath, but I've appointed you for what? To obtain salvation. What can we say about that? We can say with all assurance that believers in Messiah Yeshua, those who have received the gospel, who have trusted in the shedding of Messiah's blood as the element of redemption, we can be sure that we're not going to go through the wrath of God. Let me tell you something. Here again, it's the wrath of God only being announced that it's near at the end of Revelation chapter 6. It doesn't come in chapter 6. In fact, the wrath doesn't come in Revelation chapter 7. We're going to see that there's a statement not for the wrath of God to come, 
until two very important events happen. So with that said, look briefly with the time that we have left to Revelation chapter 6. I want you to see that it's going to begin with four horsemen. Why is that important? Well, remember what we've already talked about. John, he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to take verses, to take themes that are prophetically known by, by God's people and to take those and alter them and to weave them together to reveal greater revelation to us. That is, those things that the prophets only saw at a distance, we can see very accurately through the book of Revelation. So John as well is going to speak of four horsemen. Now, I want you to see, and we're just going to just kind of set the stage up for us for next week. These four horsemen, we're going to see in an undeniably way that they are unique, united together. That is, they work together, they're same of the, they are part of the same purpose. Now, here's the problem that people make. Some people believe because this first horseman is going to be on a white horse that it's rem, rem, it is related to Messiah Yeshua in, in Revelation chapter 19. That is an error. That is not the case. In Revelation chapter 6, we are not seeing in these four horsemen anything to do with the work of Messiah. Only thing that we're going to see is Messiah speaking the words of this scroll and bringing about the events that must take place. Why do I say that? Well, we need to remember in that discourse from Matthew chapter 24, we see that Messiah said concerning these very events that we're talking about and going to be speaking of in Revelation chapter 6, we're going to see that Messiah said these things have to take place. Why? Because God wants them? Because this is in keeping in line with His character? No. They must take place because of the rebelliousness of man. This unwillingness to surrender to spiritual truth. And, and God's going to work and do things in such a way that it's going to be very clear that people are saying no to God. They're not saying, I don't know, I don't understand. If only I knew, I would have. None of this is going to be true. All of what we're seeing is that people are going to rebel against the purposes and plans of God. And what God is doing, well, let me say it this way. It is very, very similar to what we see in the Exodus. Now, that shouldn't surprise us. Remember, we talk about the Exodus from Egypt as kind of a paradigm for the final redemption. The first uh, redemption, Exodus from Egypt. The second redemption, the work of Messiah Yeshua in establishing the kingdom. And what do we find? Well, look at verse 1. We read, and it's only one time do we see this. In, in chapter 6, verse 1, John is speaking and he says, I looked, and when the Lamb opened up the first of the seven seals. Now, why does it say that? Because it's to tell us, because these things are going to be very difficult. There is great suffering, hardship. We're going to see all types of tragedy, tragedy and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And, and what we are to be reminded of is what we've just read in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. Messiah's in control. He is speaking these things not because he wants them. They simply have to be for an end, his will to be established. Now, I want to point out one more thing before we close. What we're looking at here takes place after another battle. What battle? The battle that happens in, in the book of Daniel chapter 8. From that, that beast that comes out of the east and raises havoc and cause great barbaric activities to take place where the world says we have no helper. And what happens? There's going to be another beast that manifests itself out of the west. And this beast out of the west is going to destroy the one out of the east. And people are going to think, well, 
hooray. Evil has been put away with. And, and the good times, peace and safety is here. But remember what the scripture says. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction is about to take place. And that's what's going to happen. Why? Because this beast out of the West is, according to Daniel chapter 8, it is the Antichrist. And what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 6 is the work of the Antichrist. Him bringing about power, his power and authority in this world for a limited amount of time. And what is he going to do and how does it relate to the believing community? See, many times people want to say things and they take great comfort in it, but it's false. They'll say, you know, I'm not, not waiting for the false Messiah, the Antichrist. I'm waiting for Messiah. Well, we should be. But that does not mean that we won't see a glimpse of the Antichrist. Because the scripture says that that day will not come about. What day? Our gathering together with him in the clouds, the rapture, until first the man of sin is revealed. Well, we have a lot of exciting things to see next week as we continue on in the book of Revelation and chapter 6.